I'm going to talk about um, uh, four things today. First of all, I will summarize some of the things we've already dealt with when dealing with John Searle's social ontology. Then I will apply them to uh, chess and related phenomena. Um, then I will draw some conclusions from that application for our understanding of money with a specific connection with Searle's <coughs> one and a half theories of money. Uh, and then, if we've got time, I will talk about uh, social media ontology and about a specific thesis to the effect that human beings are being changed as a result of the existence of social media in certain ways. Uh, some of them even nice ways. Um, now, uh, You've heard some of this, but I'm, I've get, I'm going to give you now a pocket version of what you've heard already. So this is a president, this is a cathedral, and this is a driver's license, and these are all social objects. And so in his earlier book on social ontology, The Construction of Social Reality, has an account of such social objects, which is the X counts as Y in C account. So is a naturalist, which means he believes that everything in the universe is a matter of uh, energy fields or material particles or some combination of particles and fields. Uh, and so everything that exists has to be something physical. But some physical things count as social or institutional or deontic things in certain contexts. So this is Searle's theory of social objects, and it works amazingly well for presidents, cathedrals, and driver's licenses. Uh, also, it works for dollar bills. So at this point, Searle will reach into his wallet. I didn't bring my wallet, but he will reach into his wallet and wave a dollar bill and say this is a social object because it's a piece of paper which counts as a dollar bill. Now, I have worked, as, uh, as I mentioned in the previous class, on various criticisms of Searle's theory, and the main criticism is, sum is summarized here. If you have money in the form of dollar bills, then the X counts as Y theory works. But if you have money in a computerized bank account, then there is no X term which can count as a Y term. So you can't get blips inside a computer and take them to a store and use them to buy things with. So blips inside a computer are not money. They are representations of money. And so I coined the expression freestanding Y terms. Uh, these are what I think of as being quasi-abstract. The reason why I say quasi-abstract will become clear in a minute, but basically they are abstract, but they're also historical. They are part of the world of what happens and is the case, as contrasted with genuinely abstract entities like numbers or abelian groups, which are not part of the world of what happens and is the case. Now, as we've also seen already, um, in olden times when people lived in small village societies, it was possible to give an account of such freestanding Y terms based on the fact that there are memories in people's heads and that people have beliefs, and people have intentions, and they all know each other, and so they trust each other, and so there is a kind of common knowledge in the small village society. And in virtue of this, things like debts, permissions, and other freestanding Y terms exist in an enduring and, and effective way. But uh, in modern times, where we are dealing with freestanding Y terms such as computerized money, um, there are no memories or relations of trust which can effectively support the existence of those freestanding Y terms. Uh, people lie, people cheat, people are unknown to other people, and so they have no reason to trust those other people. Uh, and as a result of this, physical artifacts, basically documents, I'll be talking about recording devices that go hand in hand with documents. Um, and nowadays we have electronic documents. And all of these things represent the freestanding Y terms. 
And in virtue of these representations, which do have some physical basis, and we need to explore that feature also, the freestanding white terms can exist effectively, and Searle's theory can even be uh, used in part. The theory is still wrong. Uh, there are, are freestanding Y terms, um, and so you can't apply the X counts as Y in context C formula to those freestanding Y terms, but at least you can apply, apply it to the representational artifacts which enable those freestanding Y terms in large societies to exist. So the, the freestanding Y terms require documents. They require document acts, which are like speech acts in many ways. Uh, sometimes they involve speech acts, as when somebody says to you uh, at a border control, your papers, please. Uh, and they also depend upon surrounding systems of speech acts, document acts, recording devices, and so forth. And so in order to do justice to all of this, we need a theory of document acts of recording devices and document systems. Uh, that's a document. Uh, it, it's a, actually an, a, probably one functioning of document. It's probably valueless now, <laughs> except as a, a curiosity. Maybe it's worth 10 cents, uh, as contrasted with 15 francs at 6% per year. It's a bearer bond. All right. So we've seen some of these um, document acts already, signing a will, signing a passport, showing a passport, checking a passport. And now you might say that all of these things are just speech acts. And as we also saw, the word or the, the, the noun phrase speech act is translated into French as acte du langage. So an act du langage fairly easily can incorporate both speech acts and document acts. And both Austin and Sell do point out that there are some cases where speech acts are performed with documents. But that's always in passing. They don't actually pay very much attention to the phenomena of document acts. Uh, but there are many things that we can do with documents that we can't do if we remain solely in the realm of speech acts. So we can register, store, um, deposit documents, and we can't deposit speech acts. So when you deposit the title deeds to your house with the bank in order to get a mortgage by using the title as security on your loan, then you're doing something with the document that, you, that has no counterpart in the realm of speech acts. And I think that that me makes it obvious that we need m something essentially new, which would properly be called a theory of document acts. And when I put forward this hypothesis to my uh, friends, John Kearns is a professor here at UB who's written books on speech act theory, he will uh, wrinkle his nose and smile quietly and say, well, that's just an, art, an, uh, uh, an artificial consequence of the fa fact that we have, have limited memories and limited trust. But if we all had perfect memories, we wouldn't need documents. And if we were all trustworthy, we wouldn't need documents. And so one of the things I will try to show is that even in a world in which we have perfect memories and perfect trust, and that a world which was a bit like the small village societies that we talked about earlier, it, we would still in order to have the kinds of phenomena that we have today, ne need documents or something like documents. All right, so let's consider what we might call the dispensability of documents thesis. This is the thesis defended by John Kearns. Um, so in a village, a small village, you wouldn't need to have a will. You wouldn't need to sign a document in order to, uh, uh, in order to guarantee the disposal of your estate in the way which conforms to your wishes. You would just need to tell your family and your friends, probably you would need to tell quite a few of them uh, to make sure they're cross-checking each other, probably you would need to tell the nearest thing in the village to a lawyer, uh, but he wouldn't be allowed to take notes, of course. Uh, and in this way, you could, based on trust and memory, bring it about that when you die, your estate is disposed as you. 
suggested. So having documents is really just a, a prosthetic device to, to compensate for uh, short, shortfalls in memory. Uh, and similarly, in, if, you were, if we all lived in sufficiently small countries, you wouldn't need passports. Now, actually, I did live in a very small country uh, here uh, for three years. So this is, uh, this is three miles, so it's about six miles wide. Um, and there are, there are border control posts <laughs> which are not always manned. Um, but there is, there is also uh, a, um, a somewhat larger and more elaborate border control infrastructure. Uh, so Liechtenstein does not need a border with Switzerland because Liechtenstein has a very close treaty, a customs treaty with, 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 with Switzerland. So this is a Swiss border post in the Principality of Liechtenstein, facing Austria. And um, you need to go through that border post. Uh, now I imagine you need to go through it, and it takes quite some time. In those days, um, you, you, you just you wave your hand, really. They, no one cared. Um, now, one day I went for a walk without taking any kind of identity document. And I was not trying to prove a point here. I just went for a walk, and I ended up on the wrong side of the border. And so I had to come back through this border, which I figured was fine. I, I had my permit. I didn't have the permit in the sense of the document, but I had the permission to live in Liechtenstein. And, um, and so I was actually quite interested what was happen what happened when I arrived at the border with no documents. And... Um, I wasn't afraid at all. I, at some borders, I would have been afraid, but not this. So I had to pay five francs and sign a form saying that I was indeed a legal resident of Liechtenstein, giving my address. And I think that was about it. And then they gave me a receipt, and then I walked through. So all the documents came back into play. That piece of paper that I signed then went into the document system. And I'm sure that, well, I'm not actually sure that they checked. I looked honest. Uh, all right. But they could have checked. And they made me sign a document. They made me go through a certain ritual. And there's a lot in speech act theory, particularly in some of Austin's writing, which emphasize how the use of certain forms of language is a ritual phenomenon, including saying, I promise. That's a ritual. All right. So. This is the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that the dispensability thesis is false, that there are human activities which essentially involve the use of documents <coughs> or equivalent physical supports, but which could in principle not require documents if the dispensability thesis were true, so that these phenomena could in principle take place without any documents if we just imagine people having much more powerful memories and... Um, um, trust. And blind chess is a good example. So, so I'm, going to, I'm going to work towards blind chess and then consider <laughs> the case of poker. And uh, you, you, uh, um, so this is, this is going to be a, a, a very small ontology of war. So there are two sides and the, the, the two sides have thoughts about each other. And then there are speech acts uh, going in both directions, and eventually there is a speech act called a declaration of war, and then we have three levels. Uh, now, the speech acts and the thoughts are very interesting, but the war is a collection of events. It could actually be in the air, I guess. But the, the, the U.S. Air Force uses the acronym BFO to mean Blue Force Overwatch. The Blue Forces are the good guys. And the Air Force is responsible for watching over the Blue Forces. So that's BFO, Blue Force Overwatch. So when I say events on the ground, I don't mean on the ground. I mean any events in the real world where, we, where things like this happen. 
so war is just inside the box. The, the thoughts and the speech acts are necessary to war, but they are not part of war. And if anyone objects to that, then they can object now. All right? It could be that there are some speech acts between commanders and, uh, and, and their troops which are part of war, but the speech acts taking place at the level of the uh, authorities in the government who are actually uh, driving the war are not part of the war. Cyber war would just... Yeah, we'll come back to that. Okay. If there is ever cyber war, then this picture will have to be changed. Uh, so, war is essentially a three-leveled affair, but it's only the fictional, physical actions or the actions on the ground, perhaps including speech acts on the ground, which are part of war. And you will all remember that Searle is very fond of the idea that chess is war in attenuated form. So, this would mean that the movements of the pieces on the board are what make up the chess game. The thoughts in the minds of the players are not parts of the chess game. All right, so this is a game of chess, and we have thoughts, and we, we have arm acts, and the arm acts are not part of the chess game. Um, it's a physical movement. It's a collection, a sequence of physical movements. It could be a sequence of electronic movements if we play chess on the Internet or with a... With a I guess we could use a... Uh, a an, an electronic chess game artifact where we used levitation or some kind of brain impulses to move the pieces. But it would be moving the pieces either in the electronic sense or in the physical sense, which would be parts of the chess game. Uh, so, and then we, there are various questions which any good theory of game uh, will have to deal with. So, first of all, there is the question, what is this particular game? And <clears throat> then there was the physical answer to that question. But then that, a game like chess will also have a mathematical structure. And we can describe the game mathematically, independently of the time and the place and the people involved. We can't do that with war. We can't do that with all games. But we can with chess. So chess also, there, there is also a mathematical answer to the question, what is this game? But then there is the other question, what is the game of chess? And on the one hand, it's a social institution, which is roughly speaking a system of rules, which has things like winners and losers and checkmates and so on. And then mathematically, the game is something like the chess tree, which is a mathematical <coughs> object formed by all the games, which are the nodes in the chess tree in the mathematical sense. So that we need at least four different answers for chess. But now, what about a game of blind chess? Blind chess exists. It exists in small villages and it exists in transcontinental uh, electronic exchanges over the telephone. Um, and there are speech acts. Uh, so we go back to small village societies. Blind, the, game, the fact that there are games of blind chess proves that chess does not essentially involve anything beyond thoughts and speech acts, we might think. Uh, so in other words, at least for chess, the dispensability thesis holds. We don't need anything in the world for a blind chess game to exist. We just need people with good memories, trustworthy people. So what is, but the, the question is, what is the game of blind chess in any of those four senses? Well, the two mathematical senses, it's the same. The mathematical game is the same, whether you play it with pieces or whether you play it blind. The social institution is the same. They are still playing the same game in the social institutional sense, whether they play with pieces or whether they play blind. But what is the game in the first sense, the physical sense? It's not the movement of pieces, because there are no pieces. But it's not the thoughts or speech acts either, for just the same re reason that it was not the thoughts and speech acts in the game of normal chess. So these are indispensable to the game, but they're not part of the game. And so the question is, what is the game? It's not a sequence of thoughts. 
Uh, it's not a sequence of utterances. It's not a sequence of speech acts. The speech acts represent the movements of pieces, but there are no movements of pieces to represent in the physical sense here. So, uh, the game is, an, is, again, it's something abstract, but historical. It's a quasi-abstract event. It's a qua quasi-abstract sequence of chess move events, but there is no movement. They are abstract. Ab they are... Um, um, uh, what, what, what was what, what was Celsius's chess is the something of war the attenuation of war, attenuation of war. so now we're dealing with attenuations of chess <laughs> to be movementless um, so it's the, a, a game of line chess <clears throat> is a freestanding Y event it's an event which takes place in time which involves two specific players uh, usually human, but one of them might be a computer. I guess two of both of them might be a computer. Um, but there's nothing which, nothing physically which makes up the game. There is no X term. So we can say it's a sequence of board constellations as represented in chess notation. And these are very much like mathematical entities, but they are not mathematical entities because they exist in time and they are tied to the intentions the speech acts, the beliefs, the thoughts of specific players. And they, they are in, indeed public historical objects. People can watch a game of blind chess because it will be projected on a screen. Uh, but this, what is projected on the screen is not the game because the game would exist even without that projection. All right. So this is a bit of a problem. We're dealing with entities which have quasi-mathematical properties uh, the same sorts of quasi-mathematical properties which are possessed by debts which are um, uh, designated in currency and by prices. So we're dealing with number-like entities. But they are number-like entities which have a real-world history. This is true of debts, it's true of prices, and it's true of <clears throat> chess games, both normal chess games and blind chess games. So, a freestanding Y event is an abstract pattern tied to, a, to specific parties and to a specific series of other events, namely speech acts. Um, so, this, this, this picture is important. Down the middle is where the chess game and the, Around here are the things outside the chess game which are indispensable to the chess game. I'm leaving aside robot chess. Uh, then there's something else which is indispensable, digital attenuate, digital counterparts of these things. But the chess game itself is a freestanding Y event. And, and now we have uh, so debts. So just as a chess game is a freestanding Y event, a line chess game. So a debt is a freestanding Y quality. Um, so we have a records of the debt, we have thoughts about the debt, and then we have the debt itself, which is not made up of anything physical. It's, there is no X term, but it is historical. It began to exist when the debt was incurred, and it will cease to exist when the debt is paid off. Um, so we can't do the same thing. There's no such thing as blind war. And this is where future war on the internet Will, will take place. So we already have Stuxnet. And we can imagine a future in which war will, will be just computer viruses of different strengths on both sides and then defenses against those computer viruses. Now, I haven't thought this through, but I think that that might indeed be a counterpart of blind war, counterpart of blind chess in the realm of war. So the war, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I haven't thought it through. Maybe he has. All right, so a normal game of chess is psychological, historical, and physical. A game of blind is a physical pattern of movement. A game of blind chess is psychological, historical, but non-physical. 
So it's, it's, again, it's an, it will be exactly the same abstract pattern as the corresponding normal game of chess. But the normal game of chess will be such that the pattern is the pattern of actual movements, where here it's not a pattern of anything. Now, this pattern exists. It was born at a certain time. It lasted for four hours. That's, anyway, roughly. Um, there's no way in which that kind of entity can fit into Searle's naturalistic ontology. It's not made of molecules. It's not made of fields of force. It's something abstract. And the same applies to debts and so on. All right. Um, so these are the options for Searle. You, you can say that the, the, there is an ideal platonic pattern, the node in the chess tree, which existed eternally. And the game is just that node in the chess tree. But it happens that people enjoy pretending that they are creating the node in the chess tree by fighting an attenuated version of war. So they're not creating anything. They're not creating a new pattern. The pattern was there all along. Um, but that does not seem to do justice to all the things that we find important about chess games, namely that there is a winner and a loser and someone wants to win. And the chess game exists because there, someone wants to be the winner. Uh, in fact, both of them want to be the winner. Um, so we, we are le we're left with two alternatives. So the, the, the alternative I favor is that a game of blind chess is a freestanding Y event, whatever that means. Searle does not understand. And then Searle doesn't like Platonism. Searle wants to be realistic about the social world, so he wants to do justice to the fact that social entities have some, some sort of history. Um, but eventually... Um, he is forced into the corner of fictionalism. There is no such thing as a game of blind chess. There are the speech acts, there are the thoughts, there is the display on the wall, if you have a display of the events. There are the activities going on in the minds of the, um, of the players, but there is no such thing as the game of blind chess. That's just a fiction. And I, he hasn't ever said that, but he has said similar things about money, which we will come to. And I think that given what he says about money, this is the only thing that we can say about blind chair. So Searle has a... Um, and So I think... Oh, now I'm making one step further. Searle has a theory of money according to which there is no such thing. It's all a fiction. Searle's theory would apply, imply that the game of blind chess is a fiction. Now, Searle could have a dichotomous theory of money. He could say, well, dollar bills are money, and they really exist. They, they are physical. <clears throat> and then there is computerized money, which doesn't exist. We just have representations. He doesn't say that because he wants to have a unitary theory of money. Reasonably, a good theory of money will, will give you an account of computerized money and dollar bills as being the same sort of thing. <clears throat> so he wants a unitary theory of money, so he can either say, well, dollar bills are real money, but computerized money isn't real at all. There isn't, it's just a fantasy. That sounds like a bad theory. And so he says, all money is a fantasy. As we will see, I can quote him, page, chapter and verse. Now, similarly, if he were to think this through, he would have to say all games of chess are fantasy. They're all in the same boat. They are nothing at all. So there is, it's a fantasy that there are such, such things as games of chess. Even the ones that you can see, where people actually do move pieces of, paper, pieces of wood around on the, on the board. I think this is a reductio ad absurdum of Searle's view. And he's still alive, so he can still respond. Um, so he's responded already. So the, this argument is, some, is an argument which Searle has been has has documented that I was victorious. That he actually did change his mind, which is uh, very rare when it comes to Searle's work. All right. So the X counts as Y works for dollar bills. It doesn't work for debts. It doesn't work for games of blind chess. 
and it doesn't work for any of the other interesting social objects where there is no physical basis. So we have two sorts of social reality. Um, and we have, potentially anyway, two sorts of uh, money. I, this is the view I hold. There are two sorts of money. There is dollar bill money, where there is an X term, and there is freestanding Y money, where there is no X term. Um, freestanding Y money is the sort of money you have when you have a bank account with a, with a bank, which runs their uh, um, accounting on computers, or indeed a bank account with a bank which runs their accounting in the old-fashioned ledgers. In both cases, when you give the money, your money to the bank, then eventually, sometimes very quickly, it ceases to be... So this, is, this story has to be told very carefully. Very quickly, there is no such thing as your money in the physical sense. There is just a record that you paid certain monies, physical monies, into the bank. And that record now is that in virtue of which you can truthfully say that you have money in the bank account. You own that money. It's just that there is nothing physical that you own. Rather, there is a more complicated story which involves representations of money in record, recording devices. All right? Uh, now, this freestanding Y money is, it has different physical properties from the dollar bill money. In fact, it doesn't have any physical properties at all. So you can't set it alight, you can't burn it, you can't um, store it. Uh, it has really only one property. It exists for a certain period of time, and then it doesn't exist anymore. All right, any questions so far? I don't think I've had one question today. You're allowed to ask questions. Yes. So you said it only has the, the one property that it exists for a certain amount of time. Can it, does it have like, can it be, tra I mean, it can be transferred, right? Isn't that a... It can be, uh, so, uh, other than purely economic property, so it has, okay. it has a, a, a value, it has an exchange rate value, a value in foreigns, um, it can be transferred, and so on. So right. it, all of those economic properties will be the same as the economic properties possessed by normal money. Sure. But it's not going to have, like, physical color. No. No. It, if they change the way money is desi designated, it would change. So if, if they devalued the dollar so that every $100 bill was now worth just $1, <coughs> Then the money, I don't know, something. Yes. Why don't Why don't we see physical money just as a form of ledger, behind which a form of money like this is actually existing? So there, there is a view which grows out of the game theory, prisoner's dilemma kind of literature, which tries to view money in just those terms. So, the the the, 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 the let me let me see if I've understood your idea. Um, this is an idea which I've seen. It is as if there is a kind of gigantic invisible ledger which keeps track of how much you own, how much she owns, how much we all own, and keeps every time we spend or earn money, the items in the ledger have been are, are effectively changed. How we keep track of what our position is in this ideal abstract ledger is by using these tokens, but the tokens are not really money. They're just ways of keeping track of what, where the real money is, which is in this uh, ideal abstract ledger. Now, that sounds like a good idea. That's a bit like the chess tree idea. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like a good idea, but if you think about it, it doesn't, even though it has its origins in decision theory, prisoner's dilemma kinds of thinking, it doesn't seem to correspond to what realistically happens when people go out into the world and want to get more money. Mm -hmm. So they don't think of themselves as trying to move their position in the abstract ledger up mm -hmm. <laughs> relative to other people. They see it as, as going out to get money for themselves. 
And the abstract ledger makes everything relative. So it's, it, there is no absolute value of money. And um, all that matters is your position on the ledger relative to other people and relative to price kinds of phenomena at a given time. Now, it may sound realistic to say there is no absolute value of money, <coughs> but it doesn't seem to correspond to the way people view things like dollar bills. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I'm not, I'm not impressed with the ledger theory, uh, but I, I'm <coughs> hoping I'm going to be able to write down why I'm not impressed with the ledger theory in, in some coherent way. Um, I think the ledger theory is better than Searle's theory, uh, but the ledger theory has a big drawback which Searle could not in any case accept, which is that, that this abstract ledger is outside the realm of physics. Mm -hmm. it's a, a, it, it looks more like a thought experiment than it does mm -hmm. look like something real. Um, now, what, what I'm, I'm trying to have my cake and eat it. I'm trying to have a, a, an abstract view of money, which at the same time corresponds to our normal intuitions about money. Mm -hmm. And I'll come back to that aspect of what I'm trying to do later on when I deal with his um, later view about money. Yep. So in BFO, uh, money should be placed in generatively dependent continuant? So you have to think very carefully. Uh, if you're dealing with dollar bills, it, a dollar bill is just an independent continuum. It's a, a physical thing. It's an object. Uh, if you have money in a computerized bank account, then that means that you have a certain disposition. Um, you can spend it, in other words, or you can give it away. Uh, so in virtue of whatever it says on the ledger inside the computer in the bank, you have a very specific kind of disposition. And we haven't yet documented the precise uh, axioms governing those kinds of dispositions. But the point is that you have exactly the same kind of dispositions if you have the same number of dollar bills in the physical sense in your pocket as, as if you have the, that number of dollar bills in your computerized bank account. Modulo the need to go to your iPhone and issue an instruction rather than just giving the money to Neil, which is what he wants, really. So the conclusion is that there is a kind of disposition which is okay. common to owning $100 bills in the physical sense and to owning $100 bills in the, to owning $100 in the computerized sense, that so, the owner has, uh, and which is, it, it, it is part of a, a network of dispositions which other people have. And that network of dispositions is a bit like his abstract ledger. Uh, so the reason why I have the, the, the reason why I have the disposition which I have when I have $100 in either of the two ways turns on the fact that you have the dispositions that you have when I owe you $100. So there are many, there's a system of dispositions which we all have which form the money disposition system. That's a very brief summary of something which I haven't worked out in any, any kind of detail. Yep. Uh, you've gone over this, but I'm a little slow. So, in the case of blind chess, why is there no physical uh, thing that is the chess game? I mean, why, why can't we just say that both players have images in their heads that are in accordance with the mathematical rules of every sequence of the stage, and then they have syntactic operations that they're able to perform based on rules that they have, yeah. and all of that has physical substrates and yeah. uh, neurons in their head. And Searle might want to say something similar about money. He might say, want to say that you have some images in your mind about the $100 in your computer at the bank account. I just find that ontologically skew if it doesn't, it doesn't match up with the way we divide out the world. So we'll do chess first. Um, when you play real chess, you may have images in your mind. So what? That you may have you what you may play blind chess without having any images at all. Uh, you may just be able to do arithmetic on the the, the, the board number uh, codes. 
Uh, the images cannot be what makes up the game. You could have images when fighting a war. So what? Images are not ontologically um, powerful enough to do the job. So in the, in the and the same <coughs> a fortiori with money. If I have the board in front of me, though, whatever images I have of the chess game that we're playing, I know to be in accordance with the physical object in front of me, and I'm going to make sure that they accord with that. And if they don't, then so I'm I, th I don't think pe when people play blind, blind chess, they have the board in front of them. <laughs> yes, they don't. But they have an they, image. But in the case of blind chess, they only have the image, and so they aren't going to have that same need to have their own internal representation of reality accord with the object in front of them. They'll just take that as the primitive. So... The, the, so the consequence of your view is that when two people play ch normal chess, the images are irrelevant. But when two people play bind chess, the images are the game. Plus perhaps the record of agreed upon rules of how past turns have occurred, which they could always use to check to make sure that their images match up. Yeah, but the blind chess players who are good at it don't do any. They don't need any of that. They, in fact, they yeah. can play 15 games Does simultaneously. okay, but... It's not, it, it sounds like what the kind of thing that Searle would say to save his theory. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, let, but I, the, I haven't said fictionalism. Okay. So, your view is that the game, in the case of a game of blind chess, is a sequence of images uh, in two people's heads. All right, now, what is it if one of the, one of the players is a robot? Why do I have to say it's any different? Well, you can commit yourself to robots having images too, and sure. then we have another problem. Let's say they have images. Um, uh, Searle is on the right side of that one. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you want robots to have images? Yes. Let's give them images. Uh, well, then I'm lost because I don't see how that could be possible. I was never inside the head of a robot. I have been inside the head of a human being, namely myself. Um, so, let me see if I can find a counterpart example where you would realize that what you were saying was unreasonable. Um, so, this is not a very good example, but I'll try it on for size anyway. So Rembrandt paints a wonderful painting. And people uh, see the painting, and they have images in their heads, and then they remember it. And the painting is destroyed in a fire. Does that mean that the painting now is the images in people's heads? No. Or that the images in people's heads are the painting? No. Good. <laughs> All right, let me try another one then. Um, but I find that case is analogous to this. Um, so Rembrandt paints a whole series of paintings. And um, he decides he's done 13 of these already. He's not going to do the 14th. He will just have very good images in his head. Is the 14th painting then the images in Rembrandt's head? I think this is sort of analogous. Yeah, I don't think you've painted a painting until you've painted it. So. Uh, you can have paintings in your head. You can have blueprints for paintings. Okay, so then let me try another one then. Somebody has... So two people are very good chess players and they like to play chess in their heads, as it were. Now, by accident, they both start playing chess at the very same time, solitarily, solipsistically. And they play exactly the same game at exactly the same pace. They're playing with themselves. Each is playing with himself. Do we have two games or one? Can you play a game of chess with yourself? Well, that's another story, but I imagine that you could do something like that. You can imagine how Boris Fischer... Would Boris Fisher was that his name? Bobby Fisher would play the opponent's pieces, and so you could 
um, you could play with yourself by imagining that you're playing with Bobby Fish. Yeah, I would know that playing with me is not like playing with Bobby Fish. <laughs> I'm not that good. All right. <laughs> So we, maybe we can come back to your objection if you can reformulate it in the, for the case of money, which Searle toys with, and we, there will be passages which point in that direction. He doesn't end up there, but he does toy with that kind of idea. All right. So, um, the, so the, this really freestanding why money only has two states, not existing or existing, just as a light switch only has two states, or be, being pregnant only has two states. Um, now, if you want to take a Platonistic view, you have to hold that the entities which you are viewing Platonistically, whether they be abelian groups or new numbers, have to be abstract, which is fine for games of blind chess, not on his view, but on my view, uh, and for, for uh, money in a computerized bank account. They have to be uncreated, which is, I believe, not fine for games of blind chess or for money in computerized bank accounts. And they have to be repeatable. And now I think that games of chess generally are not repeatable. Uh, this is a, a, a tricky issue, but <coughs> let's suppose that two people play a certain game of chess, and then 10 years later, two completely different people independently play a game of chess which is de facto the same game, um, mathematically speaking the same game. It's not the same game. The number three, when, when used in two different contexts, context is the same number. But the game, because it's a, a historical event involving players with desires to win and so forth, it's a different game because it's based upon different intentions, beliefs, thoughts, acts and so forth of the player. So repeatability fails and I think it fails for debts, it fails for wills, it fails for all those other social entities because social ontology is not about abstract platonic entities, it's about entities which exist historically. Entities which exist in, historically are not repeatable in the platonic, platonic sense. Um, now, I'm, I, software is actually um, uh, a borderline case. And even chess is a borderline case because, mathematically speaking, you can repeat a chess game. Um, but some Microsoft Windows version 10 has been repeated many, many times, but it's still created. Um, all right. Now, I, I, I'm, I, I'm going... Uh, to focus on what is on this slide because I believe that this is an area of social ontology which is tremendously important but which has still hardly been explored. So social ontology has dealt with things like permissions, rights, promises, contracts and so forth which take place w between human beings. But increasingly Social ontology is going to have to deal with entities created by computers. And so we're going to be talking about collateralized debt obligations in a few minutes. Um, these so social security numbers, I believe, are very interesting social objects. And um, so the, they are culturally created numbers or something like that. So uh, there are another example of quasi-abstract entities which are abstract. They don't have physical parts, but they're historical. They were created at a certain point in time. And now the very same number can be used both as a social security number and as a credit card number. But it's two different social entities, even though it's numerically um, seemingly one and the same. All right. Uh, now, this is a question which is just an aside. What is the implication of all of this for understanding the history of mathematics? Because mathematical theorems, as some would say, are created. Certainly there are mathematical structures which are created. So Gödel's proof, the, the first paper in which Gödel presented his proof, was a creation. 
Now that creation influenced the history of mathematics and was influenced by the history of mathematics. But the paper itself is not, I, it, it, it is, I believe, a freestanding white term. It doesn't have physical parts. It's, it's a generically dependent continuum. It has many copies, but it itself is independent <laughs> of any given copy. <coughs> now, I think that there is something to be said here about the history of mathematics. And again, I don't have very clear ideas, but I, uh, I mention it um, because I think it deserves to be thought through. All right, so in the construction of social reality, Searle fatefully makes the following claim, which fits in with his theory about how, about the X counts as Y in context C uh, slogan works. So all sorts of things can be money, but there has to be some physical realization, some brute fact, even if it is only a bit of paper or a blip on a computer disk, on which we can impose our institutional form of status function. So this is the X, and this is physical realization X, and then on X we impose our institutional form. Um, so I'll drop this theory, the, this slogan, X counts as Y in context C. He, in fact, he claimed he never meant it literally. But he said it was just a, a, a useful mnemonic. But I think that uh, it was shown that this account doesn't work because you can't use blips on a computer disk to buy things or to pay off your debts. You don't, and it doesn't make sense to say that a blip on a computer disk counts as money. It doesn't make sense to say that the image in the mind of a blind chess player counts as a game of chess. That's my argument now. I'm, I'm done with that. All right, you agree? It, 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 it's skew if. It's ontologically a kilter. Um, so we, do, we just don't impose status functions on blips and computers. We do impose status functions on buildings, people, pieces of plastic, um, pieces of paper, but not on blips and computers. Rather, what the blips do is represent what is in your bank account, which is not physical. Uh, so, in uh, consequence, uh, and I think I linked to this text on the wiki page for the course, on at least one point, the account I gave in the construction of social reality is mistaken. Somebody should frame that with a silver frame. <laughs> I say that one form money takes is magnetic traces on computer disks, and another form is credit cards. Uh, strictly speaking, neither of these is money. Rather, both are different representations of money. Which is what I told him to say. Uh, and it, so in making the social world, he returns to the problem. On page 201, he says, money is a product of massive fantasy. <coughs> and I think there is a very good argument against uh, against this. So this is the thesis. Money is a product of massive fantasy. It's called the argumentum ad obviosum. Uh, this, I coined this phrase. It still hasn't caught on. <laughs> but it came from a, a, an interview with Searle. So this was Searle's own argument. So he himself is a master practitioner of the argumentum ad obviosum. If somebody tells you that conscious doesn't exist or that we really can't communicate with each other or that you can't mean a rabbit when you say a rabbit, I know that's false. So this is an argument against people like Quine. The, uh, Quine's indeterminacy of translation, Gavagai argument. So I think that this is a good argument if somebody says you can't mean rabbit by rabbit, they're making a mistake. It's French philosophy or quine or something. And I think you can apply this, this form of argument to the thesis that money is a product of massive fantasy. It, it's obviously wrong. It's, it's like saying rabbits are a product of massive fantasy. That's wrong too. 
so there has to be um, a better account. Now, what was Searle's argument in favor of the thesis that money is a product of massive fantasy? Well, he says, the recent economic crisis made it clear that money and other such instruments are products of massive fantasy. As long as everyone shares the fantasy and has confidence in it, the system will work just fine. But when some of the fantasies cease to be believable, then the whole system begins to unravel. Now, I don't think this is uh, worth very much. First of all, even though the whole system did uh, suffer very large changes, this was the Lehman crash during that period. Large organizations went bankrupt. Uh, house prices dropped considerably and so on and so forth. But money continued to be a, an effective medium of exchange in just the same way as before. And if, the, if money, uh, say the, the American monetary system collapsed completely so that people just wouldn't accept dollar bills anymore, this would not prove that money was a product of fantasy. It would prove that whatever had been the reason why dollar bills had their value and effectiveness as a, as a, as a medium of exchange earlier had now ceased to obtain. Um, so there are a number of other things that one might say uh, to this argument. I will just uh, co continue quoting Searle. Um, so for him to say that an institutional object exists is really just to say that the system works. So to say that the money system exists, the, the American dollar-based money system exists, is to say that the American dollar-based money system works. And, um, and this has to be so, he said, because the creation of an institutional fact is really just words, words, words. So we create the fact that baby John is called John by saying, I hereby baptize you, John. Words, words, words give rise to the institutional fact that the baby is called John. And how do we do that? We, how do we get away with using words, words, words to create institutional fact? By getting other people to accept the power of our words. So in other words, by getting people to accept what is just a fantasy. There is nothing in the world of brute facts, the world of physics, which Searle accepts, which changes because baby John is now called John. Rather, there are, as he sees it, fantasies that we all share which relate to the fact that we call this baby John rather than something else. As long as there is collective recognition of the institutional facts, they will work. As long as we all share the massive fantasy that dollars are money and that money is valuable, can be used to buy things, then it will work. But it's just a shared massive fantasy. This is what he says. Now, you, you, this applies also to things like banks and trade unions, but supposing, supposing you were to establish a trade union, but you, you, you went through the, the, the appropriate steps to create the trade union, it, it was a legal, legally established trade union, but you couldn't persuade anybody to join your trade union. So the trade union that you created would not work, but that wouldn't mean that it didn't exist. In fact, you're offering people membership. You can't offer people membership in something that doesn't exist. You are making a genuine offer of membership, a legal offer of membership. Um, secondly, Searle himself is very fond of the idea that social ontology is going to be useful for scientific purposes. So he thinks that... Um, if we're going to do social science in a scientific way in the future, then we need to have a good social ontology, which the social science will be based on. And so in this connection, he talks about how social ontology studies the mode of existence of social entities, such as governments, trade unions, and passports. Now, leaving aside passports, which are physical, uh, the, the, here, here he himself is accepting that these things exist, or anyway, that they have some mode of existence. Where what he should say is that the social ontology studies the acts of fantasy 
in virtue of which people believe that these things exist, which is exactly the kind of French philosophy that in other contexts Searle has fought really hard to defeat. And um, I'm, he is a very brave defender of good old-fashioned realist philosophy in other contexts, but not when he's talking about social ontology, uh, at least not when he's driven to the wall of recognizing that the entities that he's talking about are very often not physical. Um, so, status functions exist, he says. This is in the later book, where he's already given up the X counts as Y theory. We or I, so we or I make it the case by declaration that the status function Y exists. So, here he's admitting that even freestanding Y terms exist, <coughs> where on the official view, they can't exist because they're not part of physical reality, and therefore they have to be mere products of fantasy. Um, elsewhere, he talks about creating rights. We won't go into that. Um, so here he's, he's talking about um, how everything is part of one world. So there are different phenomena from quarks and gravitational attraction to cocktail parties and governments, and they're all parts of them one world, he said. But then, later on, he's talking about the created realities which are the products of massive fantasy, which presumably do not exist in one world because they don't exist at all. Um, and now he's coming, he, he says, um, corporations, and this would apply to trade unions, governments, fam uh, married couples, uh, partnerships, and so on, our talk of corporations is just a shorthand way about talking, of talking about a set of actual power relations among actual people. So the power relations have to do with brain events and responses, physical responses between different people. So they really exist in, in the one world which has gravitational attraction in it. Corporations to talk about corporations is just a shorthand for talking about those kinds of power relations. Now, I think the argument against this kind of view is that when you talk about corporations, you're very rarely going to be able to say what you want to say if you're forced to cash out everything you say in terms of power relations of specific people that you know about. So you will very often, for instance, want to say something about the power relations between two corporations. Now, the power relations between two corporations are not going to be um, the power relations in virtue of which we talk about the one corporation, namely the power relations between the people inside that corporation nor are they going to be the power relations inside the other corporation. They're going to be something very different. And you're going to be able to describe that something only by accepting corporations as being first-class entities in your ontology. And I'll try and give you some more evidence of this later on. But let me summarize the, the point I'm trying to make as clearly as I can. When you're doing social science, or when you're doing some branch of social science like economics, say corporate economics, industrial economics, you're talking all the time about multiple different kinds of higher level objects. Firms, markets, industries, um, uh, boards of directors, and so on. And you're talking about complicated relations between all of these entities. Now, the people inside those entities are also talking about those complicated relations between all of these entities. So the person who is a member of the board of directors of one firm, which is being subject to a takeover bid by another firm, is going to be able to have beliefs and intentions coherently only if he formulates those beliefs and intentions as being about that other firm. Now, in virtue of his beliefs and intentions and negotiating skill and ritual and, and so forth, he is going to be able to persuade his colleagues to accept or reject the bid. 
That means that the very power relations which Searle says, power relations among actual people, which Searle says are what we're really talking about when we're talking about corporations, are themselves only intelligible if we understand that those power relations depend upon things like corporations and references to things like corporations. So there is no neat decomposition of talk about higher level social entities like firms into lower level power relations between individual people because those power relations between individual people presuppose the higher level entities which, which the power relations are built around. Was that coherent? Some of you are looking puzzled. Let's have a, a question session. Who has questions? I have questions, but not about your criticism of Cyril. Uh, there, there. Well, let's... Uh, Gertel's theorem uh, that he's famously proved. Yeah. When do they not exist? Or do they ever not exist? So this is a, a question which you can answer either way. There is a famous passage in Plato where he talks about the slave boy drawing a triangle in the sand. Mm -hmm. And now the question is, did that triangle exist before the slave boy drew it? Mm -hmm. You can go either way. Um, and I think the same is true with theorems. It's true with physics, scientific laws. Mm -hmm. um, so did Boyle's law exist before Boyle discovered it? Um, uh, I think that there is a, an argument to be made for either direction. And I think that one direction is going to involve viewing Boyle's law as a freestanding Y term, or a freestanding Y, I don't know whether to call it a law. Yeah, given, uh, given that it's created, does it stop it? Does it? The, the theorem, say, say just a theorem, I, I've proven, girls constructed the theorem. Yeah, given I think the, the argument I gave is stronger if you take proofs rather than a theorem. Yeah, um, so, but, but go ahead, try and do it with proofs because I feel more confident there. <laughs> Um, I construct a proof. I've created this. Presumably, this is a generically dependent continuum. Or some, yeah. Take some pattern. Um, does this now that the proof has been created ever stop existing? So, um, I think yes. Uh, if the planet was. Um, fried in a nuclear explosion and all artifacts bearing copies of that proof had been destroyed and all memories had been destroyed, then I think the, pr the proof would have been destroyed. So it could, in principle, cease to exist. That's okay. I, have, I have another question. And I'm yeah? Okay. Um, you said that uh, blind chess is not... Is, what's uh, individuating this is temporal? Right? I, and here's what I have in mind. Um, say I'm of two minds and have a great memory, and I'm playing two identical games of chess with myself in my head. Yeah. Uh, are they are they the same? Is there two games or is there one game? Or? So that's a harder case. But let's re remember Searle's thesis that chess is war in attenuated form. Mm -hmm. So you agree that war is not repeatable. I would. So let's suppose you have a small war with a, re a finite number of participants and that uh, 10 years later exactly the same finite number of participants go back to war and they do exactly the same things in the same order. If it's a real war, in both cases there would have been a cause or a supposed cause. There would have been a reason why they went to war. And that reason would be historical. Well, so, so, I get the case. so you can't repeat a war. And yeah, for the right. same reason you can't repeat a chess game because the second time you go into the game, even if you end up with exactly the same moves, you'll have different motives and different feelings. No, I mean, um, concurrently, I'm playing the game, I'm, I'm of two minds in the sense that I'm playing the same game twice at the same time. Blind chess? With my, you're blind in the sense that I'm not using it. Or, or alternatively, like a computer that's programming or programmed to play the same game twice at the same time. Yeah, so I think I really do think that the question about repeatability has changed in those kinds of cases. Uh, so, can a computer repeat the same game? I think yes, you just press a button, repeat, and it does it. 
uh, because there's no the, the, what is essential to the game is missing both in the case of the computer playing it itself and in the case of the human being playing itself, namely the desire to win, mm -hmm. to crush the opponent. That's the uh, that, that's essential for it to be a real game of chess. Mm -hmm. If you're just going through moves on the board, it's not a real game. It's just going through the moves. So am I playing the game then when I'm imagining? I'm, I'm like imagining an opponent, like you were saying with Bobby Fischer. I think if you are really playing the game, then it is not repeatable. But to really play a game means you really want to win. Yeah. It's easier if you imagine playing a game with a computer. Sure. sure. So I mean, you I, really I, want yeah. to win against the computer, and then the next day you really want to win against the same computer, mm -hmm. and you play exactly the same moves, and the computer plays exactly the same moves, and you still lose. Uh, that would be a, two different games, even yeah, though. Yeah. I think so. Um, yeah. Um, maybe I missed uh, the commenter explanation of it. Uh, does Cyril talk about what a power relation is? Because it seems like that's hard to cash out. In yes. So terms. he does, and he wants it to be cashable, outable in physical terms. Yeah. Is, is, so is there any? I'm sorry. There is. I think there is some discussion of that, um, perhaps towards the end of the construction of social reality, but certainly in one or two papers where he's addressing the ontology of politics, because politics is based on power in the end. Sure. Okay. Yep. You know, in a certain sense, we can say that corporations are like individuals are on the same level. And if people, if relations, power relations between people in some cases uh, rely on uh, corporations and corporation have rights, um, so I don't want to go into the issue of whether corporations have rights. Um, I, if you forced me, I would say that they probably do. Uh, but what, what you said before that, namely that the power relations that people have depend upon corporations, then that, I think, is a very important uh, piece of information to keep hold of because it shows that Searle is on the wrong track when he says things like this. Is there, is there really such a difference between the two propositions, or are they two ways of expressing the same point? On the one hand, we're saying a corporation is sort of a shorthand for a set of, you know, so I would say, biontic relations between actors. Who but are now he's talking world. about power relations. So he does, the biontic relations are products of massive fantasy. So two, remember. But I thought that. So considers deontic power, you know, he, he obviously makes a distinction between deontic power. Okay, so I... I well, but on my reading, he would say that a corporation was a result of the deontic relations, the deontic power relations between people and not brute power relations. So there is going to be a kind of hierarchy, certainly. So there are going to be brute power relations at the very... Yeah. This is the, the view that Searle yeah. wants us to follow. There are yeah. going to be brute power relations between people. Yeah. These brute power relations will... Um, be understandable in part in terms of deontic relations which exist yeah. because of declarations and they are not brute yeah. but they're still power relations yeah. and then we have the X counts as Y in context C yeah. formula this deontic power relation exists because this brute power relation or these brute facts more generally because it will yeah. be more complicated uh, have, have count uh, as being uh, yeah. deontic in the relevant context, namely inside the company. Because then whether we say, well, look, uh, you know, a company is an entity that we treat as an individual. Well, you know, I, I suppose so would say so many individuals count as a company or as a corporation yeah. in these circumstances. You know, whether they've made the relevant application yeah. or yeah. received a royal charter. That seems to be saying something broadly similar to, you know, a corporation exists, and because the corporation exists, all these people are in the following sort of relations with each other. Yes, and what I'm saying is that if, if things were neat and tidy, yeah. uh, that would work that and it would, would be coherent, but things are not neat and tidy yeah. because at the lowest levels, the power relations that people have between each other are power relations which involve reference, ontological commitment, if you like, to, to the, the corporation-level entities. 
Yeah. And the story I told, I'll tell it again, see if I can do it more clearly this time. So we have a board of directors. There are power relations in the brute sense. In, in the, some, Where would the brute power relations be in a board of directors? That's so a, I right say um, this is the end of the meeting. We are not going to discuss this topic. We have made an agreement. You all nod your heads and you stop talking. Now, in the end, that has to be a brute power relation. There's no magic deontic juice <laughs> which uh, makes any difference. But the, the reason why I can get away with that is because mm. you all believe about me that I am the chair of the board. But doesn't that make that power you have to either commence or conclude a meeting by fiat? Isn't that a deontic power that you yeah, have but, in virtue of being so chair? So remember, if X counts as Y in context C, that means that the deontic power I have has to be based upon br not just my brute powers, but yeah. on brute facts. Yeah about physical power relations. Well, I guess so there, there will be things like, if you don't agree with me, then I can call an emergency meeting of the Council of Disputes or something. Yeah. Um, but isn't that a deontic power too? Yeah, and that's really the point yeah. I'm making. But yeah. so has to have, it's a, according to the official ex councils Y story mm. anyway, so it has to have it be the case that we have all these physical beings called organisms, yeah. which are existing, in, affected by brute facts. Yeah. There are only brute facts, but those brute facts become colored or described. Yeah. Um, they, they become felt, uh, another brute fact, in yeah. different ways in virtue of beliefs, which are also brute facts yeah. in, the, in the brains of the people involved. Yeah. Now, if we can have all the brute facts ready laid out in the, on the bottom and then we we see these things as being deontic in this way and those things as being deontic in that way. And then we can see those deontic things as being deontic squared in this way and those being deontic mm -hmm. squared in that way. We get these bigger and bigger and more complicated deontic edifices growing up, which is the way, way Searle wants it to be. Yeah. Then I think that would be a coherent okay. account. Now, one failure of the account turns on the freestanding Y terms. Yeah. But we can treat corporations as being Y terms with X terms underneath them, namely the brute people yeah. at the bottom. So we may be in good shape, but now it doesn't work in the way he wants because the, the deont there has to be a deontic iteration. So mm -hmm. deontic squared phenomena, so believing that the other corporation is bad, has to rest on a deontic at the first level phenomena, namely believing in corporations or something. Yeah. So he talks about this iteration, but we don't have an iteration because... The, if we're talking about beliefs of the board of directors, their beliefs are already about, the, so at the brute level, they're already mm -hmm. about deontic squared or deontic cubed phenomena. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe it will become clearer when I talk about yeah. collateralized debt obligations, because there yeah. we do have yeah. collateralized no, no, debt I obligations. That's, I think that's already, already clearer. Good, yeah. good. So I really want to get this clear, because I really yeah. think it's an important objection to Searle Mm -hmm. which is very hard to formulate. Mm -hmm. And um, so, a corporation is just, just a placeholder, the same holds for electronic money and blindfold chess, the owner of the money and the possessor of the queen. So he means the queen with a piece of wood. He doesn't mean the queen of England. Um, so when we say the queen, we all have to stand up, first of all. Um, have the relevant powers. Um, so he, again, he's trying to reduce the deontic phenomena to physical powers, I believe. Uh, because if, then, if he's not reducing them to physical powers, then he's not getting anything. He still has this deontic jelly that it wouldn't be physical, and then it's his naturalism would crash. And then my question is, well, what happens if I take my money to the bank where, and it's credited to my account, the paper money is shredded, then the powers hop from paper to person. So is it a person in the bank now that has the powers because he owns the computers? So my $100 worth of money spending power is somehow translated so that the cashier in the bank, that doesn't seem reasonable. The owner of the bank, that also doesn't seem reasonable. The programmer of the computer, certainly not. 
So where do those powers go? How do we tell the story in terms of moving powers around between people, which is what he wants? So it's, it's talk of corporations, blind chess games, money is a shorthand way of talking about the set of actual power relations among actual people. Mostly you can't identify the actual people when you're dealing with complicated financial phenomena. All right. Um, so, and then we can prove that deontics can obtain even if the system works. Remember the deontics for Searle, the massive fantasy, obtains. It, it, it just means the system works, but we can have the system working without there being the deontic powers. So if we have fake money circulating, everyone believes it, it truly is a massive fantasy. But it's still not money, even though the system works and everyone shares the same fantasy. Um, we don't need to do that. Well, this is funny if you're talking to a German audience. Uh, so Hans Weininger is a German philosopher who wrote a book called The Philosophy of As If, which basically says that all interesting things are massive fantasies. And, uh, well, I won't translate the German. So, and it, it even works for the United States of America. So it's a real country because the system works and people believe it's a real country, but actually it was founded illegally. So, where the Confederate States of America tried its best, um, but it never got to be a real country. But all of that, so the, the, so even the United States of America is not a real country for so. So that, that there has to be some system between the difference between the United States of America and the Confederate States of America. We like to think, because one is a real country and the other isn't. But for Searle, even the United States of America is a fiction. Uh, so, when, when you create a corporation, so these are all quotes, page 100, we make it the case by declaration that, and notice that he's talking about freestanding Y terms, that an entity Y exists, so good, and a, a freestanding Y term exists that has status functions F in a certain context. And then he says, we have to put it that way because we need to specify not just that the functions exist, but there is an entity Y, the corporation that has the functions, even though the entity is, as they say, a fictitious entity. Now, this is called having your cake and eating it. So, on the one hand, he has to say it this way and use words like actually and exists, but then... Uh, he, he says, even though the entity is a fictitious entity. Now, the United States of America is, is just like any other fictitious entity from this point of view. Even the United Kingdom, even Australia is a fictitious entity. Ah, so, there is an element of imagination in the existence of private property, marriage, and government, because in each case we have to treat something as something that it is not intrinsically. Small children can say to each other, okay, I'll be Adam and you'll be Eve. Um, so I think I've said all of that. So money loses value is supposed to be an argument for money being a massive fantasy. But does that mean that there is a degree of being a massive fantasy? If it's high value, you're a massive fantasy, but you're a low level. If it's low value, you're a high level fantasy. Uh, that doesn't seem to me to be coherent. Um, and can you measure the, the degree of being a product of fant fantasy in different currencies? Um, I guess I should pull the screen down. I've forgotten why I have this picture. Uh, all right, a little bit on the ontology of stocks and shares. Um, 
so stocks and shares again are products of massive fantasy, but they are indispensable to ensure coordination of massive collections of people over long periods of time. Um, so they're like roads. Um, well, how would we think if somebody said that roads are indispensable to ensure coordination of the exactions of people, but roads do not exist, they are products of massive fantasy, all that exists are molecules of concrete, or something like that. We would say that they were obviously wrong. Roads exist, stocks and shares exist, and a good ontology has to do justice to that. Uh, so, he, he, he confuses the dimensions of loss of value and loss of existence. He makes a false analogy between credit default obligations and the euro and the doctrines of communism. So he says, well, suddenly people stop believing in the doctrine of communism. And therefore, communism was a fantasy all the way, all the way along. Um, I don't think that makes sense. The fact that suddenly people start believing that the dollar is less valuable and so it loses value doesn't mean that it never was valuable. Um, and, and most importantly, he contradicts his own John Wayne robust realism. All right, so the ontology of poker. Uh, before we do this, let's see if there are any more questions. Yes? Say again. Ah, now religion is interesting. Um, so, um, uh, what so would, yep, so would treat religion in the same way that he treats money. It's a product of massive fantasy. The only way in which so would treat religion differently would be if somebody convinced him that God has physical existence. So there is some physical that, uh, pieces of evidence that God exists. Then God would be just like uh, tables or chairs. In, in this case, the atheism, it's, it's not the same thing. That, uh, so materialism, physicalism, naturalism, atheism are all part of the same basket of positions, uh, roughly the default positions of American philosophers. A mainstream American non-French American. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm different because I believe in freestanding white term. Yes? Would, would something like the Abrahamic uh, you know, monotheistic incorporeal god be a freestanding white term whereas something like an idol would, would work on Searle's earlier formula? He could do idol worship, yes. He yeah. wouldn't have any problem with idol worship. Yeah, well, the, the, the Abrahamic the God would, would... I don't think he would even say, what, say it was a... He has to make a distinction. So let's just suppose for the sake of argument that uh, Christian or Judeo-Christian monotheism is false. I believe that Searle would not say, oh, it's just like money. So that money is false too. And beliefs in money are false. Beliefs in the God of Abraham and Isaac. Uh, are false. And it's just the same, that all three standing white. I don't think he would say that. He would say that the God thing was false in a much stronger sense than the money thing. And, and this would be so even if the religion uh, worked. So if you had flourishing societies, which you do, which are based on monotheistic re religion, it would seem that they have their, a massive fantasy which works. But I still believe that Searle would say that it was quite a quite different sort of thing. It was a, a rather like Santa Claus. Although I'm not even sure that he's down on Santa Claus now with the Adam and Eve passage I just quoted. Um, when we, we have some hallucinations, we think that it's possible. Yeah. They believe that the, the, the sun and moon, they are God. And they exist. Yeah. So they're in a better shape. <laughs> Idol worship is in a better ontological shape from the cell point of view. Because there is an X term now. So you can believe in X terms to your heart, heart's content. And you should do. All right, so let's do poker. I'll try and do this quickly. Um, so can there be blind poker? 
And it's hard to set up the thought experiment. You say no, but we'll see. Um, I'm going to try my hardest to prove that there can be blind <laughs> poker. Um, and th th if I can prove that, then I could have... Uh, so I believe in the indispensability of documents or in, of counters, chips, record, records, representations for many social phenomena, for fi finance and so on, modern finance, modern law, modern healthcare, they're all based on documents and representations, and now they're based on e -documents. So I absolutely believe in the indispensability <laughs> thesis. But as a thought experiment, I tried to work out whether it would be possible to have blind poker. It, just like we have blind chess, which means no chips, no cards, no playing field where you show your cards and so on. Just two or n people communicating electronically or even just communicating in a room. They would be blindfolded so they couldn't see each other's facial expression. Uh, or maybe we allow facial expression because they, they belong to the speech act kind of world anyway. Um, so we, the idea is in a small village society where everyone is honest and uh, the, the society is a society of people with really impressive memory powers. Could they play a game of poker in the same way that two people can play a game of blind chess? So no cards, no chips, no money. Um, so, and there is a book called Poker and Philosophy, which contains one or two passages which are relevant. Uh, so this is about the, the social ontology of chess, which we'll come back to later on. It's quite interesting. By actually a former graduate of UB, um, by the name of David Kepsel. Um, so there, there are some newspaper items about blind chess players, but it turns out that they are only somewhat blind. They just have really big cards so that they can read the cards. But that's not blind chess in the sense I mean. Uh, so we're interested in live poker. We're not interested in online poker. Online poker has recording systems up the wazoo, so the, the online poker is even further from blind chess than is uh, a, a game of cards with real physical cards. So we forget online poker, video poker, we're just interested in live poker. And now there are two issues here. Um, one is you can't see the cards because there aren't any cards. And the other is that you can't see the faces of your opponents. And as I say, I'm not so concerned about seeing the faces. That's an important part of the theater of poker. Um, I'm more concerned about people not seeing the cards because there aren't any cards. And this is the blind poker player I referred to who uses special big print cards. I'm not worried about him either. So the no cards, no digital images, no, no chips, just thoughts, speech acts, and memories. So we assume that there is no memory problem. So we have to imagine that there is a dealer, and the dealer deals secretly in his head. I, um, and then as he's dealing in his head, he gives cards to each of the people. He remembers what cards they all have. And he has a tiny microphone, which is connected to the ear of each player, and he mumbles quietly as he's dealing so that they know what cards he's just dealt them. Are you with me? <laughs> and um, so the problem is not memory. We assume that we've solved the problem of memory. The dealer knows who has which cards, and each person knows which cards he has. The problem is, um, well, one problem is you, you, you don't play folk poker for fun in the way in which you play chess for fun. You play poker to make money, to win. That's the whole point of playing poker. The betting is an essential part of the game. But there are there's no money. You can't use money. You, have to, you, you can't use tokens. You can't use chips. So you have to assume also that the dealer remembers who has how much money. So each person starts with $100 or 100 chips. And they remember how many they ha have. And when they bet five... They remember that they now have 95 and that there are five in the pool. And the, 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 when they bet five, they have to do that by muttering <laughs> through the microphone to the dealer 
to explain what they just actually no they can they can speak the bet openly because everyone has to know how much you bet so they say i bet five and move their arm but they don't actually put any money on the uh, is it called a river um so the important thing is that we need a dealer that everyone trusts and there's this cow thing uh, if you didn't want to use money you could use thousands of a cow but that's not important so there is a big difference between chess and poker in chess everything is open so chess is a complete information game where in poker some things are hidden which is why the dealer needs to talk very quietly through the microphone so that the other play players don't know what cards each other player has uh, so chess is a game of perfect information chess pieces only have one face where card playing cards have two faces so we have to mimic concealment within the realm of blind poker um, so the, the dealer has to be able to communicate secretly with the players but he needs and he needs to remember who has what cards at every given stage and they just need to remember what cards they have at any given stage and they have to remember what bets they've placed and um, remember everyone's honest so if I say I've placed five five chips everyone will, rem will remember that and everyone will will be truthful when they uh, work out how much they get when they win uh, say the dealer is in a different room and actually has real cards but the other he's just telling them yeah that would be cheating you can't do it that, that way would that would prove that cards were indispensable okay, so the dealer has to do it all in his head <clears throat> I'll just deal and give you a random card. Yeah, that's the next slide. So, <laughs> um, um, so, so first of all, sometimes the players would need to communicate secretly with the dealer. And so either they mumble in the microphone or they go outside the room. Um, so they have to tell the dealer which of their cards they throw into the muck and which they keep. Um, all right, so in press chess, because chess is a perfect information game, you can't cheat. But in poker, there is something like cheating. Uh, so it's called bluffing. Uh, and it, So for live poker, bluffing is an essential part of the game. And it's not just, pay, it's not just making very low or very high bets to make people believe things. It's also fa facial gestures and, and, and so forth. Uh, I don't think we need that. So we need a counterpart of that. So there are two outcomes. Uh, everyone shows their cards and then you see who's won, or just one player is left after everyone else folds and then he wins by default, even if no one knows what the other players would have had if they'd shown. Uh, and then there's the dimension of the theatricality. Um, so to play poker well, you have to be good at theater and at uh, deception. And that's hard if you're playing blind. Um, so I'm, I'm getting to the randomness now. So this is something more from David Kepsel. Um, so he, he compares the rules of the game of chess with the rules of the legal system. Um, And of course, the legal system is a massive fantasy too, for so. And then, um, well, more about bluffing, really. So, the, the Ingvar Johansson is an, another person who has been uh, in Buffalo several times. Um, he and I have collaborated on many projects. So, he points out that there can be blind chess because the players are the source of their moves. But he says there can't be blind chess, blind poker because the players are not the source of what cards they have. I think that's wrong. We could have a dealer who deals. Uh, but um, as is pointed out, the deal has to involve randomness. So shuffling the cards is what we do physically to simulate randomness. Uh, if we don't have any cards, then we can't do shuffling. And so either the dealer would need a random number generator or a random card generator, but that would be a document or a re recording system, 
or the dealer has to find a way of simulating randomness. Um, moreover, the dealer has to not just simulate randomness, he has also remember the, what random order the cards were dealt in and to whom the cards were dealt. So we need his brain to be the recording system. So is the problem of randomness a defeat for the dispensability thesis? We can't let the dealer alone generate randomness because he would, be, he would have some non-random effects. So he would prefer certain numbers because he thinks they're more random. Uh, and, and then good players would spot that, and then you wouldn't be playing poker properly anymore. It has to be genuine randomness. Or anyway, as close as you can get. So what you would need to get genuine randomness is to have dealer elves assistants. I say a thousand. And each of them would, would announce the next card secretly to the dealer in turn. And so any effects of one person random generating would be eliminated. Um, so in this way, speech act poker or blind poker could achieve the same degree of randomness as any random number generator. You need a lot of people to do it, but you could do it. And you just need a thousand microphone connections to the thousand elves who were picking the cards in order. Um, so, um, th there would be another problem that the dealer, who suddenly became female, um, <laughs> would have to re-communicate back to the elves which cards have been dealt. So even though the elves have to pick a card independently, they have to know what cards have been picked and remember, so that they only pick a card from the the cards which are left. All right. So the conclusion. Um, even if we can have blind poker, so we can have blind poker without recording systems, without cards, without chips, without uh, the, the functions of cards generating randomness and so on. We could do all of that. It would be absurd, but we could do it. But what this proves is that the game of poker could never have evolved without cards and chips and the effects which they bring about. So you couldn't have poker without cards. That's pretty obvious. <laughs> but part of the reason why you couldn't have poker without cards is because to simulate what you have in poker without documents involves a gigantically complicated um, roundabout process and that gigantically complicated roundabout, complicated roundabout process could never have evolved in the way that games evolved in the natural order of things. So it's evolutionarily indispensable, but in theory anyway, logically possible that you could have blind poker. Um, all right. Any? So the interesting thing is that cards and chips, or documents more generally, involve phenomena to be instantiated very easily, like random num randomness generating, um, just by, not even by being very complicated documents, but they are documents which are in certain places at certain times. So these are my cards, they're in my hands. And those are your cards. And this is my money and I put this money here. And those simple movements with documents are very difficult to sim to mimic using speech apps. And this is board games, card games. Uh, this, this is a, a social phenomenon which arose as people it, it realized more and more of the things that you can do with these very, very simple artifacts. Um, all right, so any questions about poker? Yes? If the dealer had a perfect memory, couldn't he uh, memorize every combination? of cards that you could possibly choose. Uh, but he would still have to choose at one at random. I guess if he really did have a perfect memory, yeah. then you yeah. could do it that way. But you, how would he pick the combination that he's going to use in this particular game? He's probably going to pick combination number 376 or something. Right. He won't pick I mean, combination one. So everyone knows combination one is ruled out. He could pick one at some point. No, so everyone would assume that he would never pick one because it doesn't seem random. 
He would never pick one, the combination number 1,000. He would never pick 10,000. He'd always... Why not, though? Because he thinks he's trying to pick randomly. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if he's really self-conscious about his tendency not to pick round numbers, he will start to overpick round numbers. And then the players could predict this. He's probably picked a round number again. <laughs> okay, I mean... I don't know. I mean, that, that, that's it's very hard to generate to randomness by, by yourself. Yeah. So I, I think I agree with you that it is random the way you set it up, but it seems like you could also just argue that it's just a watered-down edition of the non-randomness, just because there's other people who are not choosing randomly, and you put them together in a big assembly. It's still. Yeah, so not every random. random number generator has a certain threshold. Um, yeah. And I think that just by adding more elves to the list, you can get over any threshold. Yeah, okay. So you can get as random as you like by yeah. this one. Doesn't it not need to be perfect randomness anyway? Because in live poker, it's not like the cards are actually random. They depend a lot on how the deck was before. Yes. Okay, so I need just so many elves to simulate the degree of randomness which normal poker card shuffling generates. Uh, in a in a legal, honest casino. But doesn't that give the dealer with perfect memory a little bit of leeway? Uh, so I, I I gave in on randomness anyway. I thought that randomness was it that you couldn't have blind poker because you can't generate randomness without some kind of record. But I've given in. I, the elves can solve the problem. So I give in to what you said. I'm you're you're uh, you're knocking against the open door. <laughs> yes? But just out of the strict, your conclusion in response to the objection of the dispensability argument is uh, uh, yes, you're right, but it's evolutionarily involved. Or, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, this is interesting. I thought you were going to go a different route and say there's something essential to poker, uh, like the strategy involved where you're bluffing. That makes it so that you can't do this. So, that I, I, as I say, there are two aspects of blindness. One is you can't see the faces or the gestures or the theater, mm -hmm. and one is you can't see the cards and the chips. Mm -hmm. So, I was focusing just on the you can't see the cards and the chips. Mm -hmm. I think that real life poker essentially involves the theatricality, the etiquette, the bluffing, and so forth, which is essentially a vis visual thing. Mm -hmm. so, and so, you couldn't have blind poker in the second uh, aspect of blindness if you play with uh, at all if you're playing with a strategy right? but you couldn't have high level blind high level blind. yeah like you could uh, play the lottery without a strategy yeah or yeah blindly. yeah yeah but can you have a blind lottery i think so i think so. in I a think small so. village yes yeah, which strategy or without one I, I don't think my grandmother has a strategy yeah but she does buy tickets a blind lottery you wouldn't buy any ticket no you just tell people, <laughs> yeah, I now owe you a dollar, and you get your ticket. And she says, okay, <laughs> your ticket number is this. And then... wondering in cases where you're, you go and play poker and you're, you're playing against the house, isn't the dealer a representative of the house, and so couldn't play the role of arbiter among the different players that they have to play in the case of blind chess? Because they could lie since there are no documents and then reap money in favor of the house. Uh, yes, so if you can have blind poker with perfectly trustworthy uh, and, uh, and uh, good memory, well, well remembering, what's the word? Uh, uh, high high memory type people. Then you. The next question is: Could you have blind poker in a world where the people are dishonest and cheating and bluffing and, and lying, uh, providing you had a dealer who was keeping track? And I think that's an interesting question. So, that, but I leave that one. Does the card serve as a document that keeps the dealer from lying on yeah, the yeah, house? Yeah, yeah. So you need a, a an authoritative dealer who has a good memory. Or you could have him have cards. He, it's the players who aren't allowed to have cards, but he can have cards as a check. 
When it comes time to see the cards, do the players say their cards, or does it either say what everybody's cards were? Oh, the, it wouldn't matter if you are dealing with trustworthy people and they all have good memories. So it, it comes to the same thing. Right, but if you are playing with untrustworthy people as long as the dealer is Then it would make a difference, then you, yeah. But then if the dealer is in the room, probably everyone would be trustworthy at those points where things can be checked. And it, it's, if you have perfectly trustworthy people, all of whom are known to all of the other people to be perfectly trustworthy, could you have bluffing anyway? Because that's kind of deception. The one bluffing person would be really well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, now I'm going to talk. I still have a bit of time. We've talked a little bit about Hernando de Soto. Um, uh, let's go back to. Um, well, this is just the soul business X and Y. Uh, this is a identity document. Um, so then the question is, what, what does the ontology of documents look like when we move from paper and plastic documents to electronic documents? And with, with paper and plastic, we have lots of redundancy built in, which I explained a week ago. Uh, but what, how will things go <coughs> when more and more we're dealing with people who are <coughs> surrounded by a, uh, a, a halo of electronic um, uh, information. Uh, I, I didn't say avatar, um, so I'm not going to say avatar. I, I just said avatar. Um, but you can think of them, some of these things in the spirit of virtual reality if you want. Uh, so the idea is that increasingly, just as the world of financial services was influenced by the possibility of high frequency trading and of, of creating hugely complicated financial artifacts like collateralized debt obligations, cubed. Um, so social reality is being changed by similar phenomena. So people are being changed. And um, I, I'm just going to give you some illustrations of how I think this works. So Searle himself makes a distinction regulative rules, which merely regulate what already exists. So the etiquette regulates eating behavior, for instance. Or constitutive rules which allow new forms of behavior, and a good example is the rules of chess. Without the rules of chess, we wouldn't have chess. With the rules of table man without the rules of table manners, we would still have table behavior. Um, and by performing speech acts, you create certain institutional facts. We've seen all of that, and these institutional facts include things like money and property and so forth. And these institutional facts exist because of language use, law, and psychology. Um, but these are to be viewed as bottoming out in brute facts, which are facts of physics, um, or facts of natural science. And these are facts which are independent of all, all human institutions. And the institutional facts arise at successively higher levels, and they're built up through operations of language use and psychology and so forth. Um, so beliefs and intentions create more and more complicated deontic orders. And so is not French, and so he recognizes that there have to be brute facts at the bottom. It couldn't be that we have institutional reality all the way down. Uh, so wherever a status function is imposed, there has to be something it is imposed upon. He now doesn't believe that because he received, received the wisdom of the freestanding white term. But it, it, it correctly, the hierarchy must bottom out in some sense in brute facts. It's just that some of the bottom brute facts have to do with representings rather than with the actual things themselves. And these brute facts are not just a matter of human agreement. So they are what they are independently of whatever theories we have, whatever beliefs we have, whatever language we use. And now I want to say that there's something missing. Um, I want to argue that, that we can't... So this is parallel to some of the things we said about corporations a few minutes ago. We can't have this nice hierarchy of brute facts going up and up because we're being affected already at the brute level by the existence of the world of social media. And this is, the, the, a good example of this is the way reputations are affected by social media. 
so um, we I don't know if you all have credit records, but certainly all, all I guess you all have credit records. And the fact that you have credit records has changed you. And you will realize this change whenever you go to get a bank loan or a car loan. Uh, that, that what You won't notice, of course, because you never lived in a world in which there were no credit records. But now that there are credit records, everybody is more honest in relevant circumstances. That means we've been changed by the existence of, a, of an institution. Uh, because we have credit cards, we've become more mobile. Um, and if you travel internationally a lot, you realize how big a difference that makes if you lived in an age when people didn't travel internationally a lot and when there were no credit cards. Um, when, you, when you take an Uber, uh, what's the word, Uber journey, Uber trip, Uber trip, I guess would be. Then you are allowed to rate your driver. But the driver also gets to rate you. And in this way, everybody becomes more well-behaved when taking a trip because they want to take trips in the future. And if they get bad grades from the drivers, then they won't get trips. It's not so easily. So in this way, we're becoming more well-behaved, cleaner, um, less liable to vomit. Um, because of the way in which social media affect our reputations mutually. And this is going on all the time. Uh, there are now tenant referencing services for landlords. So if you have a, a house or an apartment to rent, then you can use one of these referencing services in order to ensure that you get honest, reliable, clean <laughs> tenants. And in this way, the existence of these referencing services make tenants more honest, reliable, and clean. And uh, professors also get rated. Mm -hmm. So I still don't think I have one of these. I've been teaching underground. So I'm still invisible on rate my professors. But most of my colleagues are not invisible. We'll, we'll change that after yeah. today. No, I don't think you should do that. I think it's good to be invisible. Um, so, good behavior is being rewarded and bad behavior is being punished. Uh, so, not just reputation is being transformed, guarantees are being transformed. So if you buy something, then the nature of the guarantee is very different from the piece of paper that you used to get. Uh, various kinds of institutions and social actions and commercial interactions are being in, transformed in radical ways. Um, so the, the, a simple example would be going through the uh, check-in gate at an airport. So in the olden days, when they said, we are now ready for boarding, everybody would immediately crowd in a kind of Italian way around the... Uh, <laughs> so that no one could get through. It was chaos. But now each boarding pass has a zone number and the computer will only let you through, so it will only do the green thing, if you ha have the boarding pass with the right zone number. And so the, 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 the digital effects of boarding passes, which are very interesting objects, uh, and which have changed radically just in the last couple of years, because now you don't have to have a paper boarding pass. So you can have a computer or an iPhone boarding pass. Um, so they've changed the, the, the etiquette of boarding in a very positive way, at least for people in Zone 1. Um, so, Searle's idea that there are just two levels, brute facts of physics and institutional facts, uh, doesn't work anymore. The, the world of or organism reality, the human reality, is being changed as a result of digitally-based institutions within which those human organisms have to negotiate their lives. So it changes family. If you have an, a cell phone, then your relations to your family become very different from what I do. You're, you don't need to worry so much about your daughters, for instance, uh, late at night. Uh, it changes commerce, so you can pay bills even in the middle of Africa 
uh, very efficiently, um, where before it may have taken 100 miles of journeying and, and, uh, and even then um, you couldn't pay the bill properly because the office was closed or the, uh, the person wasn't there. Now you can do that without any uh, of the traditional hurdles. So um, on the old theory of personal identity, um, so I'm not sure I believe this because it's somewhat French, but I will pursue it for just a little bit. So on the old theory, and the, which is a bit like the cell theory, you are a biological organism, you're part of the physico-chemical world, and you have various plans and skills and a, a, a reputational trail created in other people's brains, and your plans and skills are features, dispositions of you, of your brains, and of your body. On the new theory, there are gigantically complex networks of plans and skills and reputations. So all of the trails of all of the people you know, and many people you don't know, are, are complicating, complicating, complicatedly intermeshed with each other. So I don't yet have a rate my professors, but I am rated on a number of internet sites for other things. Um, and on the one hand, these ratings make possible new kinds of job offers or new kinds of collaborations, or uh, they, they affect the way I do my science in different ways. Um, they prevent me from doing science in certain other ways. Um, that I think they make me do better science. Uh, yep. Should the second formulation still begin, you are a biological organism, but now your plan skills are uh, answer that question in a minute. Um, all right, so I, um, I think that we need to understand the, the science of these things, and that means we need to start with the ontology of these things. So how are we going to understand how people and societies are changed with, uh, through the, this digital intermeshing which is going on uh, in all corners of what so we call the institutional world? Um, now, there, the, the one example which I'm not going to talk about in detail is con concerns military training. So nowadays, nowadays most military training is performed uh, in, in a way which involves, in one way or another, computer games. And you can program computer games so that you change the physiology of the person by repeating the same kind of situation over and over again, so that the person who is being trained becomes physically agile in responding to specific kinds of stimuli. So this is a bit like learning to play the piano. So you learn to play the piano by repeating the same motions with a keyboard. You learn to kill people using drones by repeating the same motions over and over again with a keyboard, but it's a different kind of music. Um, the, um, so I think that we are uh, in a position now to change the organism by means of digital phenomena like video games. And maybe all teenagers are being changed already. Maybe you're all changed. Maybe you're all somewhat robotic. I didn't play video games when I was an adolescent, so I'm unaffected. Um, now, there is a book published in 1991 about the features of emerging media. So we, we had the cell phone gentleman in the African uh, Bush, uh, who was communicating with his family a hundred miles away. So this is possible because of things like cell phone. We can, he was communicating very quickly. You can publish very quickly. So when I started work, it took three years to publish a paper. Now there are pa papers in, in disciplines like biology and bioinformatics which get published within a month. And that really is a quite different um, uh, environment for publishing. There, are, there is a movement which I'm associated with loosely which wants to eliminate even that month and have immediate publication of all data uh, in the first raw form. Don't go through the process of describing the data in a paper, just publish your data and have other people try and fish interesting results from it. Uh, communication becomes interactive. Uh, you could merge different media forms. So I talked earlier on in the course about merging video with music. And that's a trivial kind of merging. There are now 
uh, many, many complex kinds of merging of different media. Um, but now we can create new kinds of digital entities, not, not just merging the existing kinds, new kinds of art, new kinds of financial instruments, uh, new kinds of human interaction, um, new, new kinds of overviews. So now you can look at the practically the entirety of philosophical literature. Uh, you can see all the papers that were ever written in a single list which mention Immanuel Kant and chocolate. Or Immanuel Kant and uh, Mariology. And you, you couldn't do that even 10 years ago. But now, it, practically the whole of the literature, I'm not sure about Japanese literature, but the whole of the Western literature on Kant, you can search very, very effectively. Um, and therefore, you can catch plagiarists, which you couldn't do before. Um, you can catch people who claim to have discovered a new phenomenon, but in fact are just reinventing a wheel which is already well known to other people. And you can catch various kinds of fraud and so on and so forth. Um, so, the, 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 we, we, we were, the question was, are we just biological organisms with these intermeshed skills and re reputations and so forth? I think that we, we were always biological organisms which had various kinds of human capital. And now the internet ranking systems are contributing to the development of more refined human kinds of human capital. Uh, so there is now a website called People, which is it's supposed to be Yelp for people. Now, I think very soon, when we walk around with our iPhones and we point our iPhone at people, we will get a little screen which will tell us whether they're good or bad or honest or dishonest or uh, tell lies or have a, have a bad credit report. Um, so we, we, we'll see the world, in other words, where people really do appear to have physical, tiny, tiny halos above their head, which describe their, their basic uh, information. And people is uh, the first start. And um, so initially, you're, you can find like-minded connections with high people number scores using our nearby feature. So I could find out who in the room has the highest score for I don't know. Um, I think I have a list. No. Following three categories. <laughs> professional, personal, and dating. And your people number is the total number of recommendations you have received in all three categories. And these things are going to get more and more refined if they're not made illegal. Uh, very soon, actually. Then, of course, there are just good old-fashioned dating sites. Um, for instance, Tinder. But now this has a consequence. The fact that we have all of these uh, sources of information about each other will mean that we will also be required no longer to be the same person in different contexts. So we will create personae. And now I really will use the word avatar. I, anyway. Um, so, the, we already know that there is such a thing as identity theft. I want to start thinking about the ontology of identity. And um, so you can have, one person can have multiple identities. I think that's clear. So where, there, there is a common um, meme in war films about how a soldier dies in battle and the, the, a neighboring soldier takes on his identity, pretends to be that person and thereby becomes a person without a criminal record. Um, there are various other ways in which people take on different personas serially. So when a policeman puts on her uniform or when a fake policeman puts on a, a policeman's uniform, whether a fake uniform or not, or a fake priest, or a stalker, somebody on the web pretends to be somebody or some kind of body, some kind of person that they're not. Or witness protection, whether people are moved to different parts of the country and given new identities. So these are all ways in which one biological organism can be different persons in the sense of 
people with different persona. But we can also have a one persona for multiple real people. So uh, the Smiths might use a single email address. Then we have single persona who are copying real person. In other words, they are taking on the persona of someone else. And this happens, obviously, in a, when, when we have a play where Napoleon is represented by an actor. Uh, but it happens also when you have an avatar in Second Life. Um, um, so I, I discovered that in Second Life, um, people buy and sell things. And this is probably something that you're all completely familiar with. Um, but I also discovered that, they, that some people use real money to buy these Second Life artifacts. And then I discovered that the Second Life economy of people using real money was worth $2 billion. But then I discovered <laughs> that the reason, I thought that was a really interesting fact, and it proved that many people were crazy. <laughs> but I then discovered that the reason was that someone had found a way to use Second Life for drug dealing. So they were not actually buying these Second Life artifacts, they were using Second Life as a bank. Um, all right, so we've had that. Um, and that's it. That's the end. Finished early today. Yes? So I even finished my slides, which is kind of a miracle. So there's a even, I think, more interesting story that you might be interested in checking out related to your second life example. Uh, there's a video game called EVE Online, which, you know, another massive multiplayer online game. Um, incidentally, it also tends to uh, focus a lot on corporate life. So most of the game is mining, and then people set up corporations, and then they fly spaceships to go mine asteroids, and so on and so forth. Um, but a lot of it is based around also, like, corporate espionage. And there's a, there's a story about how uh, a hit was taken out on the corporate leader of one of the biggest corporations in the game. And somebody took up the contract for this hit and proceeded to work their way up that corporation over the period of a year, become real friends with the person who was the head of the corporation in real life, went and stayed at their house and then proceeded to uh, work their way up to the point where they were the second in command in this corporation, and then in the in game killed them. Assume while they were dead, assumed the mantle of first, you know, first, cor uh, first corporation person, <laughs> and then stole all the assets of the corporation, which is worth real money, and just completely decimated this this corporation. So there was a real corporation. Th there was. A oh, this was just a corporation in the game. In the game. Okay, and how could it be worth real money? Because people like like Second Life. Okay, so okay, online. okay. Yeah. Sad. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting too. Yeah. I yeah. think I think the ontology of identity, for me, is a really important question, and I think it has something to do with the way that brute, you know, kind of the world of, of meat uh, actually articulates with the world of, of institutional identities and so forth. Um, because, of course, in a legal system, too, you can be a trustee and a corporate director and a private you know, individual. Yep. You can and be a doctor and a patient. Exactly. And you'll, you'll, you'll own, but, but sort of the point in the end in law is where I, uh, I own assets as a trustee and as a private person, and those two patrimonies are kept legally separated. And my acts as a private okay, person that's a good one, yes. won't affect the assets. For example, my personal insolvency yeah. or bankruptcy won't affect the assets that I hold as a yeah. trustee. My personal creditors won't be able to access those, good. And, and vice versa. I think, you know, not only is that a really important area where social ontology has answers for law, but where by looking at maybe some of those relationships, we might work out difficult questions in social ontology. Um, that, that deal with where brute relations um, or where you know, the, the brute universe connects with yep. the institution. Yep. Good. Any more? Yes? So your Alex writes this, why? 
Oh, freestanding entities exist at some times, but they do not exist at other times. Yes. Then, uh, in providing a formal philosophical description of the existence of freestanding uh, Y entities, do I need to something like the time relativized existential quantifier or something? Well, I, when I'm talking about these things informally, I tend to take the presentist view, which says that what exists exists now. Uh, if I'm being very careful, I will say that what exists is either what exists now or what has existed in the past. And um, when, when I was drawing those pictures about non-exists, exists, non-exists, and I was taking a, a God's eye view and looking at the entire history of the universe, um, I don't think any of those require a relative, relativization of existence. Uh, we can just have exists and then recognize, well, I guess it does require at least giving the information that when we say this, th this particular thing exists, what we really mean is that it exists for this, for this period of time. I, there can't be any freestanding Y terms which exist eternally. But there might be freestanding Y entities which exist from a certain point and then forever after. And I, I, I'm guessing now, um, but the fact that the Western allies won the Second World War might be one such example. So even if all the records and all the, the memories are destroyed, it will still be the case that the Western Allies won the Second World War. Any more? Okay, so we will meet again next week.